Right. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to see you. I want to welcome you. I want to say hello to those of you who are watching online. Let's give it up for them today. Come on. We got groups watching from all over. We got a new group in Seattle that is watching. I want to welcome you and say hello to those of you who are watching with us. Grab your Bibles. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, just like Will encouraged us to do as we're continuing in a series in this book of Ecclesiastes. While you're turning there, I heard the story about a little boy who was lover of baseball. He was on a baseball team and he decided to, uh, he had a game that day, he decided to go out in the backyard. He was waiting on his mom to get dressed to take him to the game. He had his uniform on, goes out in the backyard, decides he's going to warm up a little bit, takes his baseball, baseball bat. He takes the, the ball and he says these words. He says, I am the greatest batter in the world. And he tosses the ball up, takes a big cut, totally misses the ball, says, Strike right, one. And then the ball falls on the ground there, you know, and he's undaunted. So he goes over, picks it up again, and he says, I am the greatest batter in the world. Tosses it up, takes a swing, misses it even more now. Strike right, two. Ball's down on the ground again. Now, he, he looks at the bat. Something's wrong, you know. Something's not right. Spits in his hand like a good hitter will do. Get a little dirt. Gets a good grip. Straightens his hat. And he says, I am the greatest batter in the world. Tosses it up again. Misses Steerike. Three, you're out. He shakes his head. He starts to walk inside. He said, well, obviously, I'm not the greatest batter in the world, but I am the greatest pitcher in the world, Right? And that is the view of someone who is an optimist, someone who sees things with that glass half full rather than half empty. Now, as we've been looking in this series of Ecclesiastes, I wondered as I heard that story how Solomon, also known as Kohelet, okay, the speaker, the teacher, how if he were taking that swing and he missed, what would he say? Probably be something like this, right? I hate this stupid game. This game is meaningless. This game is pointless, right? Now, what we've been learning about Solomon is, is he's kind of in this place of despair. And we might even say he's a bit pessimistic. We would say for sure that he is realistic because he's taking a look around at some of the things that are happening in his life all around him. And he's, he's feeling very disillusioned now with his life. He's not happy. Now, what's What's fascinating to me and probably to you as well is being in the place of being the king and at this apex, remember he's a representation of the apex of, of what human life could be, right? He has more money, he has more opportunities, he has everything at his fingertips and yet he's still so disillusioned with his life. I mean, as I, as I read, I couldn't help but think a little bit in the book of Ecclesiastes Y'all know Winnie the Pooh, right? I couldn't help but think of Solomon's a little bit like Eeyore, right? Remember that? It's like, kind of like, oh, well, I was so upset, I forgot to be happy. And it's like Solomon, as, he's go, as you're reading about his, this journal of this man's life, you're finding that he has this very negative outlook upon his life. And what I would tell you is the negativity is there, because he is faced with some reality. There's some reality that he can't seem to quite get around. Now, go with me again to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to read there today. We'll look at a few passages in the New Testament as well. But if you've been following along, it's important that, that, that you know this, that this book has been around for around 3,000 years, but it couldn't be more relevant than what it is for us today. There's so many folks that are going through our lives. And remember, Solomon will say, I, I tried to discover the meaning in life under the sun. And we've been explaining what that life under the sun really is. It's, it's this world. We had paradise that God created. Now we're kind of in this place in the middle, okay, because now we're in a sin-cursed world. Because of our sin, and God told us that if we sinned, he told us this, that this world would be broken, it would be sinned, we would surely die, and that's kind of what we're experiencing. And so when you see life under the sun, this is what he is talking about. The way we could say it is life apart from God. Now in chapter 2, just catching you up, if you weren't with us, he starts getting more specific about his pursuits. And he talks about his pursuits of pleasure. He thought in some way, what we're going to discover is that it seems like Solomon has this hole in his soul. 
that he is trying to fill that void. So he will go after it through pleasures. He's gonna pursue pleasures. And we discovered last week that he tried with laughter and comedy. He tried with cheering his body, he says, with wine or, or mind-altering substances, maybe just to take the edge off, feel a little better. He tried his relationships with women. We discovered that he had over a, a thousand relationships, maybe more, right? 700 wives, 300 concubines. He tried entertainment. He tried all of these different things to fill this hole in his soul, and yet he still was coming up empty. He still wasn't quite feeling like he had meaning in his life. So what does he move on to? He moves on to projects. He tries to stay busy. Remember, I remember a few weeks ago, I was on a treadmill and I was going the whole time and I was, I was so active and some of us are so busy and we're so active and yet many times, just like on a treadmill, all we do is end up right where we started. And this is exactly kind of where he was at. He tried possessions. He tried these pursuits of pleasure, and all this really did was expose the hole in his heart even more. And he was wrestling with this. He was struggling with this. Solomon, if you'll recall, was also struggling, and what was leading him to a place of being so despondent was this, was there was this ominous, ominous shadow that was chasing after him that he could not get around. Do you remember what that shadow is that he can't get away from? death. Everything that he would try to do, what you could write this down, that Solomon was actually facing the reality of his mortality. And he's struggling with this idea of, even though I'm the king and I have more money, I can't buy my way out of this. Even though I'm the king and I have power and armies, I can't raise an army to defeat it. Even though I'm the king and I'm I'm wise. He was wiser than any other person at this point. I can't outwit it. It seems like it's coming for me and it's, it's futility. He, he uses these words. And I want to, some of you are newer. I want to catch you up. He uses this word. It's vanity. It's futility. And I want to explain this to you if you're new. It's not like I'm in a mirror and I'm vain. It's this word, Hebrew word, havel. And it's this. It's, it's vapor. It's, I, I, it's real, but I can't get my hands around it. It's here and then it's what? Gone. And he's saying it's vanity. Then he says it's this. It's chasing after the wind. In other words, it's exhausting. I'm running hard, but I can't, I'm not making any progress. He will use these these terms over and over again, he's exhausted, he's tired, he's worn out, he is, what I'm going to tell you, I think he's about to move into a place of depression. That's a place that a lot of people get to within their lives. So we pick up where we left off, and now he's going to shift gears. He's going to come at this from a different angle. What he's been doing is he's been trying experimentation. He's going to experiment with all these things, and now what he's going to do is he's going to turn more into a philosopher, and now it's going to be more about observation. He's going to take a look at some things, and he's going to begin to put into practice the wisdom that he knows that he has. And so he's going to compare a couple of approaches to life. We would call it the wise way of living and the foolish way of living. And so here's what, by the way, this book, as I have said every week, doesn't pull any punches. This book is a sobering book. It can be a, it can be a discouraging book if you don't know the right lenses to look through, okay? And so again, if you're new, hang on with me today because... It can get a little dark, and it, I think Solomon gets to the darkest place. But i got to tell you, the authenticity, the realness of it is refreshing. Even though it can be heavy, it's refreshing because he doesn't water things down. He calls it like he sees it, and he's not just trying to say everything is okay all around me and put on a fake smile. We're getting a real look into the, into the window of a man who is deeply struggling. Some of you can identify with him. And by the way, I've said this every week too. I really believe that this book of Ecclesiastes, as hard as it is, I believe this, it should bring us, it's designed to bring us to a place of desperation. It is designed to bring every one of us that reads it and engages with it to this place of realizing there is something wrong in this world. There is something that is missing within my soul where I can't I can't seem to find real meaning within my life. What I would say is that it's like 
every path that Solomon would go down would lead him to, and I want you to feel this, this dark, dead end, this dark door that slammed in his face. And he gets there and he's discouraged. After every pursuit, another door is slammed. Another door is slammed. It's dark. So now he's going to begin. There's like there's no hope, right? He's going to begin to, to, to really begin to take us to where, here's some good news. There's a little glimmer of light. A little glimmer of light you're going to begin to see. Ecclesiastes 2, it's, it gets darker before it gets lighter. So I turned, he says, to consider wisdom. That's verse 12. Wisdom and madness. Here's his observation. Madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. What he's saying is, I'm the king, okay? Because I'm the king, I have more opportunities than any other person that's living right now. There's not a lot of people that are going to get to experience more than what I have the authority to get to experience. That's what he's saying. Then I saw that there is more to gain in wisdom than in folly. So he's going to start making a wise observation, but it's still not the total answer. He says, as there is more to gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks around in darkness. So he starts comparing these two ways of living, this foolish way of living and a wise way of living. Now, when we speak of foolishness, and as he is speaking about this, this isn't a lack of intellect, because there are a lot of people who have a lot of degrees who are really intelligent and yet are huge fools. And this is, this is, this is a truth, and Solomon is wrestling with this. It's not about intellect. That what he's saying is wisdom is this way of kind of living your life calculated with careful thought, thinking about the consequences of things. He's saying, you know what, that's not a bad way to live. And I think we all would agree. That's not a bad way to live, all right? But then he's, he's going to begin to come to a conclusion. Remember what Solomon does is in every pursuit, he takes it to its furthest extent, he takes it to as far as he can possibly take that line of thinking. So he says this foolish way of living is just kind of just stumbling through life. It's like living in the dark and no thought, carefree, kind of no thought of consequences. Or, and he's saying, obviously, it's better to, to have some thought and wisdom in your life. But there's something that he's going to say. Yet, and yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. What's the event? What do you think he's talking about? It's death. We don't even like to say the word, do we? It's death. And then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. You see, it's like it's chasing him. He can't get past it. Why then have I been so very wise. He's like, what's the point? Why, why do we even choose living rightly then? As I said in my heart that this is also, here's that word, it's there, but it, it's gone. That's, that's the point he makes. He uses it over. I won't spray it every time because it gets on my glasses a lot, okay? But for the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring. This is, this is interesting. He says, there's no enduring remembrance. He's saying, I won't even be remembered. Uh, now, we are still talking about him today, but let's think about just general, generalizations of this. Look, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. That, that's heavy. That is heavy. I don't deny this. The one thing he can't control, and, and he is a guy you got to know who is in control. There's a reason he's a king. He can control all things, it seems, people, situations, his best of the ability to control these things. He can't control this. And, and it's bothering him so much. He knows this truth that death is the greatest batter in the world. Death's batting a thousand. Because throughout the age, excluding Jesus, right? And, and, and here's what's happening. He knows this, that the wise person is going to die just like the fool. He knows that the, the rich person is also going to die just like the person in poverty. 
And he's wrestling with this. By the way, I read an article this week that I thought was fascinating. It was, the article actually came out this week. And it is on, it's on the Silicon Valley tech billionaires who are pooling their resources together. And what they are seeking to do, and, and I'm going to quote some of the things that were in the article. They are seeking to, these are their words, cheat death. They're trying to figure out how to get around this issue that we're trying to get around it, right? We want to we wanna live eternally, right? And, and so they're calling themselves the billionaires, and I thought this was interesting terminology, that are chasing immortality. Can I tell you this? It's this. They're trying. They're trying. They have more money than any of us, right? And they're, they're trying to figure it out, and... This, this is what we've been trying to do from, from the, the very beginning of the point where we have had a problem with sin and death. They're trying their best, but it's, and they can do whatever they want to do with their money, but the reality is you'll never get your hands around that. It's, it's like chasing the wind. And this is what Solomon would say. It's vanity. And it's, it's crazy how so many times things happen and we have no idea that it's going to happen. I walked out last week between the second and the third service and I looked off over to the south and this is what I saw. I saw smoke coming up just on the horizon over there. I thought, what in the world is that? I wonder whose house is on fire is what I, I was thinking in between services. About this time, last week, and little did we know that there was a plane that was exploding and crashing just a few miles away from where we are right here. And I, I was reading some about this this week, and, and it's interesting because here is the mentality. Let's, let's be real. None of us ever think it will be us. We're not thinking like that. I mean, it would be morbid to think like that all the time, but, but the reality is, is we never know. There was a lady who, she was being interviewed about this. She said, I made a decision that morning to go to the grocery store. Little did she know that decision would save her life. She was driving back on Azel Avenue. You know where I'm talking about. We're familiar with this. I mean, they're talking about this across the nation, but it happened right here. She was driving on Azel Avenue wondering, I wonder whose house is on fire. I wonder what happened. She gets in her neighborhood, and this is what she discovered. It was her house. Her decision. We, we never think it's going to be us, but the, the truth is it could happen at any point. And Solomon is thinking, when it is my time, what will I have to show for this? Will I have anything that is of significance? Uh, will, do I, can I figure this out? Then he says these words. There's not even a remembrance. He's going to an even darker place. There's not a remembrance. So we try to remember. What do we do? We, we make tombstones. And we don't make them out of cardboard. We make them out of something that we think is going to last. But what do we know? Even the granite, even after a few hundred years, you can't read the names. Did you know that some of the greatest tombstones in the world are, are, are here's a couple of them right here. The Taj Mahal was, was created by an emperor who made this to memorialize his deceased wife. But I want to ask you a question. Without you Googling it, do you know who they were? I wouldn't know their names without looking it up, okay? Um, the pyramids. The, the pyramids are, are also, they're tombstones, grand tombstones to those kings and pharaohs of that time in Egypt. But, but honestly, I wouldn't really know any of their names except the only reason I know one of their names is because Steve Martin did uh, King Tut back in the SNL days, and I've never been able to forget that. Do you remember that one? Okay, if you're in my generation, you do. But that's really only one of the reasons why we remember. The point is, is we just, we just don't remember much. I was telling my dad the other day, we were sitting together, and I honestly, I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know what? I really barely remember much about my grandfather because he died when I was really young. I was talking with my dad about that. I said, I don't remember much about him. Tell me a little bit about him. My dad was. But here's what I can also tell you. I don't remember anything at all about, about my great-grandfather. Or my great great one, because I never got to know him. What, what I'm trying to say is this: is that, is that these brains in life under the sun, we struggle with even remembering. 
Some of us more than others. Randy's shaking his head for me, okay? Because I can't remember things. But, but the reality is, I mean, do you, do you remember when William Henry Harrison was president of the United States? I mean, he rose to the highest level. Some of you are like, who? Yeah, a president. Which, by the way, he was in office the, 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 the uh, shortest term because he got elected and shortly thereafter he died. And it, and it happens. Or, or how about this? How about this heartthrob? This recent heartthrob, ladies. Are you ready? It, it, it's this guy right here, John Gilbert. Do, do you remember him? Well, he was a heartthrob in the 1920s, but most of us, he was a household name. We don't know his name. I had never heard of this guy until this week. But it'd be kind of like the, the Brad Pitt of our age, right? Everybody knows who he is. And you're thinking, well, it's it about 100 years ago. In the grand scheme of, of all of this, that's not that long ago. Do you see what Solomon is saying? We don't even remember. And this is what he's getting at, this outlook. He's looking around horizontally at life under the sun, and he is finding nothing but despair. He's getting depressed. And he says this, and I think it's the darkest verse in the entire book. I want to I wanna bring it up, and I want you to say it with me, okay? Because I want you to feel it. Say it with me. What does he say? So I, what? Hated my life. Have you ever been there? I hated it. I hate how I feel. I hate the emptiness. I hate the feeling of no purpose. I hate my life. Solomon says this. Keep in mind. He was the king. He had everything. Everything the world could offer him. And he says, what is done under the sun, on the horizontal plane, is grievous. This word grievous, it means this. There was no net gain. It's, it's again, it's a math term here. I tried to add it up and subtract the effort and nothing to show. I have nothing to show. For all is and he's using his two phrases he loves to use, vanity and striving after the wind. I'm going after it. I'm staying busy. I'm working. But whenever I finally slow down enough, I know there's a hole in my soul. I know there's emptiness there. Now, keep in mind, right, lest I throw you into a depression today, which is not my intent. Remember this. This is what he's saying is life under the sun. Life under the sun. What do we know? This world is broken. Remember, we said you got to look at this book through two important lenses, and Solomon didn't have the benefit of understanding that there, he knew there was something more, but he couldn't quite get his hands around it. He knew there was supposed to be a Messiah, but he didn't really know that much about it. Guys like Isaiah who were prophesying, they hadn't even, they hadn't even prophesied about the coming Messiah yet. He's struggling. He's feeling darkness. He's trying, he's, he, he's just trying to figure this out. He's, he, he, so he's experimenting, he's observing, and he didn't quite get this about Jesus yet. He had a limited lens he's looking through. And we said that is called progressive revelation. He also, what did we say? When you talk about life under the sun, it's life that is cursed because of of sin. Now, what do we find with Solomon? His outlook, he's bored, he's discouraged, he's getting depressed, he's sick and tired of being sick and tired, he's tried it all because what he's discovering is that every one of his pursuits is vanity, smoke. I know that's how a lot of people feel because I talk to a lot of folks all the time and they're trying to find something to fill the hole of their soul. And, and, uh, I turned 50 this last week. I'd say that Solomon was kind of in this midlife crisis, do you think? And when I, or not this week, last year, I mean, um, when I turned 50, something kind of happened to me. Now, sometimes people say it's 40, and, um, but for, it was, for me, it was 50. Now, I didn't go out and buy a sports car. I uh, didn't buy a big medallion, you know, for my chest or anything like that. But I did start asking, even as a believer, I started asking this question. Even as a pastor, I started asking this question. Is my life really mattering? Is my life, am I making a difference? 
Am I doing the most that I can do for the kingdom of God? That's what I was thinking. And I, and, and I started in this place of assessing, okay? And Solomon is at this place of assessment, and he doesn't like what he's finding out about himself. He's desperate. He's on the horizontal plane here, and, and, and he hasn't been able to figure this out. The wise man, he says, still ends up dead. Now, what he's going to do in this observation, he's going to move from, from wisdom. He's next going to move to what a lot of us will do to keep our souls distracted. We will look to find our meaning in our work. And this is what he does next, okay? So he says this, verse 18. Some of you can relate. I hated all of my toil in which I toil under the sun. Remember, Apart from God, I want to be really clear, work is not the curse. But because of sin, now our work is cursed. Okay? Um, and so he goes on, and he says, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a w wise man or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. Come on, say it with me. This is also what? There it is. Smoke. And he says, so I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair. Some of you relate to what he just said right there. I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes, sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. And what he's saying is, that is not fair. It's not fair. This also is, there it is again, vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun, you could say this, that Solomon was seeking his significance through his work. He was trying to find, now this is what a lot of us will do too, our identity, our security. Again, not, not, nothing wrong with work. But when you're looking for that to fill, to fill the hole in your soul, let me ask you a question. What happens when it goes away? What happens if you lose your job? What happens if you retire? You see what I'm saying? This is what he's getting at. In fact, what we will do is we will get into something that where others may find other addictions, some of us are addicted to our work. And we become workaholics. And we stay busy. And, 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 and the reason is because we don't like to slow down or maybe we're trying to get approval or we're trying to make enough money because we want to provide enough for our family. There's a lot of distractions, and, 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 and so here's what Solomon's doing. I'm telling you, this is what he's doing. He's looking around. He's looking at his kids. He's looking at who he knows is going to be next in line, and I, I can't prove that this is exactly what he thought at this moment, but he looked at his son, Rehoboam, and he thought, what am I doing all this for? This kid is a fool. By the way, if you read the rest of the story, you'll find that he was exactly right because less than one year, everything Solomon worked for, the kingdom was at its pinnacle. Rehoboam messes it all up. The kingdom splits. They end up being conquered by others. He was right on point, wasn't he? Everything he worked for, right? And that's not to say that all of our kids are fools, okay? That's not what's being said. What he's saying is, I work so hard for all this, and I don't even know if those that I'm working hard for, I don't know if they will fully appreciate all of this. It's happened many, many times. His security was found in his job. His status was found in his work. His identity was found in his work. And, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with retirement. There's nothing wrong with that. But but even in retirement from our vocation, remember we talked about this earlier in the year, there has to be some meaning and purpose even in the midst of that. Where do you find that? If the job goes away. What's interesting is Jesus addresses the same mentality. You're going to start seeing, I'm going to start really pointing some things out to you, that Jesus will address some of the same things. He'll use some of the same words that Solomon will use, and he will refer to this. Paul will get to in a minute. We'll also use some of the same things, but there's a different outlook. What's the different outlook? Okay, well, first of all, let's see what Jesus says. Luke chapter 12, there were some people that came to Jesus, and they were trying to get him to settle a dispute about money that was happening 
between some family members. And then Jesus told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. Then this rich man said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And this is what he says, and I'll sit back and say to myself, self, my friend, you have enough stored up away for years to come. All right, now say this next part with me because it actually sounds pretty good. Now take it easy, right? Say it with me. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now hang on to that. We're going to see something in a minute. But God said to him, what are the next words? You fool. Now, is God saying he's a fool because he's maybe has some bigger barns? I don't think that's what the point is. That's not the point. The point is this. We have no idea because look what he says. You fool, you will die this very night. We don't know. We don't know. Then who will get everything we worked for? Or you worked for. All right, now here's a key verse, okay? Because this is where it's going to begin to shift for us in this message. It's going to begin to shift. You're going to be glad, okay? It's also going to begin to shift. We're going to see a shift that starts happening in Ecclesiastes. You're going to see a little turning point. Everything so far has been looking at life on the horizontal, life under the sun. Now something, did you hear what Jesus said? What we really need to do as we're engaging in life under the sun We really also need to start having a little bit of an eye, not a little bit of an eye, an eye on the vertical. Because what does he say? He says, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. There's nothing wrong with having things, okay? But storing it up and thinking that's going to bring you your identity, your security, your status, he says it's foolish. He says to do this but not have a what? Rich relationship with God. There's the turning point. Back to Ecclesiastes, verse 23, chapter 2. So here's what Solomon says. For all of his days are full of sorrow, this guy who's working so hard. And his work is a vexation. That word vexation means this. It's worrisome. It's toilsome. He is worried about his work. He's anxious. Even in the night, he says, His heart does not rest. Oh, how many of us that could describe us perfectly. We're so consumed with our jobs, trying to make a little more, trying to stay ahead, right? And he says, it's vanity. Now again, work is not a bad thing, but work as your identity, he's finding it's not filling the hole in his soul. I mean, this guy couldn't even get a, a good night's rest. Have you been there? He was so worried about what somebody might say or what somebody might do or the, the deal he might lose or this. He's just consumed. His mind and his life is consumed. That is another pathway. Or, or what we're finding is this, and you know this to be true, Solomon didn't even have one of these. Because these, although they can be a blessing, Never turn off, do they? Some of us, our jobs are connected to this. And where it used to end, let's say at 5 o'clock, for many of us, even who struggle with workaholism or whatever, we have a hard time not continuing. (laughs) So our brains never get a break. And Solomon didn't have to deal with that. What Solomon is saying, pleasure apart from God, projects apart from God, possessions apart from God, work life apart from God, Life under the sun is dark. Boom, the door is slammed in his face on work, on wisdom. But do you notice something? There's a little bit of light, a little light that's starting to trickle through. Are you seeing that? There's a little bit of light, and it's going to start changing just a little bit. He can't see past it, but he sees a glimmer of light because he's going to start mentioning this. Now, Solomon's going to shift some of his perspective. All he's been looking at is around him. That's been his outlook. But finally, he's going to start looking a little more vertically. Solomon finally looks at his life above the sun. And rather than just looking at life under the sun, he starts to catch this glimpse Maybe there is some purpose that can be found in this. 
a perspective that starts to change. Do you know up until this point, he has barely even mentioned God, and this is a book in the Bible. Now in the next few verses, he's going to mention God four times. Something's starting to shift in his thinking, his outlook starting to change. Just when he is at this place of despair and depression, it's overwhelming him. Overwhelming him. He's starting to look up a little. He's starting to, to look beyond his certain circumstances that are, that are just beating him down. And you know what he is finding out is this truth, is that only a relationship with God can fill the hole in your soul. That's true. All these other things, the food, the drink, the pleasures apart from God, they don't completely satisfy. There's some pleasures there, but they don't satisfy. It's not lasting. And when God fills this hole in our soul with his presence and, and we have a relationship now, write this down, the mundane things now, even those things have meaning. Even the job, some of you are probably not going to like this, but it's true, even the job you hate can now have meaning. Even some of these things that are mundane things of life, they now have some purpose. Solomon recognizes there are actually, he's going to say there are actually some gifts from the hand of God to be enjoyed. He, he's, go, he's going to mention there's these gifts, okay? Look at what he says, verse 24. There is, he says there's a better way of living. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment. Now, man, you should say amen right there, right? Do you see eat and drink? Jesus said something about eat, drink, be merry, right? But he says find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. He's starting to see it's more than just about myself. He's starting to see that these pleasures... Some of these good things, like a good job, some of these things like the good food, some of these, he's starting to see these things. These are actually gifts from God. He's starting to see vertically. And only God can fill this hole in our soul. When God fills our lives, these mundane things begin to take on meaning. Now, the pleasures, when God is in the midst of them, remember last week, if you were here last week, you even got a piece of candy in church. Gave you a piece of candy, and I, I said, th th you know, taste that. And those senses are going, that chocolate, your, your, your serotonin is now going right. Remember what I said last week? God created pleasure for us to enjoy it, and we invite him into the middle of it, and we're thankful for it, okay? And this is what's going on. God, I want you to hear this, wants you and I, he wants us to enjoy our lives, but you can't fully enjoy it the way you are meant to enjoy it until the hole in your soul has been filled by Christ. Amen. That is when the enjoyment can actually begin. <laughs> because I'm not on the pursuit anymore. I've found what I need to find. Now all these other things can begin to have some meaning and I can enjoy them. Here's a big key of Ecclesiastes. When we're living life apart from God, you need to hear this. It is depressing. It is despairing. When it's apart from God, but when we actually are in relationship with him, now all those things that are not sinful things are things that are good things in our life, and they are a gift from him. Some of us, we have this idea that God is just like angry all the time, and he doesn't want us to enjoy it. I'm telling you, God has created us to enjoy this life. To enjoy that. The things that, 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 that you've been striving for, right? Now, it's interesting. Solomon has been striving. He's been getting after it. Life on the treadmill. He's been doing all of these things. What's interesting to me is finally he stops the striving and he finally, he finally receives something. Gift. Grace. Striving. Grace. Works. Grace. There's a big difference here. Remember, we're still, though, under the sun, and this world is still broken. But now we can have, instead of just that perspective alone, we not only have an outlook, now our outlook that we've had can turn into an uplook. Now we're looking vertically. Now we're looking through a different lens. So I want to give you some takeaways, okay, from this passage as we start moving towards wrapping this up. Do you remember what Solomon's greatest enemy 
was, what's his greatest enemy, church? Come on, what's his greatest enemy? Death. Solomon was looking at this dead end, this closed door. Wait a minute, there's a little bit more light coming through. A little bit more that's starting to come through. He knew there was something beyond this door of death, but he just couldn't see it yet. Now, when I came out, some numbers started rolling. And a lot of times we'll put a number up on the screen because your kids are acting up and you got to go to them, okay, all right? It's not that many kids that are acting up today. That's not what this is. You may be wondering what this is. Well, last week I gave you chocolate. This week I'm giving you the worldwide death clock. You. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm a giver. I am a giver. What you're getting today is these are real-time numbers that when I started preaching, for every one Every one second, 1.8 people in this world will die and slip into eternity. Now, I did not kill them with my sermon, okay? (laughs) But what do we mostly think? I mean, it's true. Well, those are numbers elsewhere. You know what? I've done a lot of funerals this year. And someone said, Matt said something to me before the service. He said, you know what's also interesting is to think about every one of those numbers. There's a family around every one of those numbers in most cases. So there's a lot of hurt and brokenness there. That's a lot of hurt and brokenness, wouldn't you say? Those are real numbers. Real numbers. Solomon was dealing with death, this shadow. He keeps running into this door that is slammed in his face you got to see what Jesus says. John 10, I am the door. You feel that? I'm the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be, come on, what? Saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now the thief, he comes only to steal and kill and destroy. This is our Jesus. I came that they may have life and have it, what? Abundantly. You get this filled in, and now I can really start to live. Now I can engage in life under the sun in the real kind of way. I want you to see this. Jesus took on our two greatest enemies, sin that separated us from God, and death, and through his death on the cross and his resurrection, Now, through faith in Jesus, we get to enter in with confidence. Not because of what we've done or how good we are or going to church or through religion. It's based upon through his grace, through faith in Jesus. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, do you know what you are gifted? Eternal life. Amen, Amen, right? Now I don't have to. Now, these bodies are still going to physically die. Paul would even talk about that, right? He would talk about how it's a tent that's going to be folded up. It's still going to physically die, but now you don't have to live in fear of this looming number because the truth is, for all of us, our number is going to come at some point. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. When I start looking through the lens of Jesus through the lens of the crucifixion, through the lens of the resurrection, that number doesn't sting me quite as much for me personally. The fear of death. As believers, we live live our lives through this lens of Christ. And and even, even when the time, when our number does come, we can have some confidence. Now, without Jesus, I would agree with Solomon. It is just that. Without Jesus, folks, there is no hope. You see why it's so imperative that we keep preaching the gospel to people all around the world? Without Jesus, it's vanity. Paul would even say, listen to the same words, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, just real quick. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in, it's vain. And your faith is in vain. In verse 17, and if Christ has been raised, your faith is futile if Christ has not been raised. 
It's futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. If he said if we only have hope right now, but we don't. We have hope beyond this right now. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality, he says. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass, you ready? The saying that is written. Come on now, help me out. Help me out online. Say it with me. Death is swallowed up in what? Victory, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Thank you, Jesus. Right? Yeah, I clapped for him. That's what he did. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, he says. But thanks be to God, Paul says this, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the next thing he says is, therefore, so because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, remember all those families that are surrounded by all these people who are hurting and all this? Let me tell you something. This world that is so desperate needs us as believers to be people of hope and faith and love and comfort. Look, my beloved brothers, don't go in that place of despair like the rest of the world. No, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So even as you're working in your job, you're all, who are you mainly working for? The Lord. Now you have meaning in your work. Knowing this, that the Lord, that the Lord, that knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. It has meaning. There's meaning there. Where Solomon said, it's all meaningless. No, Jesus said, no, with me, it's meaningful. Now you can have meaning. Where, where, where Solomon would say, it's pointless to keep going on. Paul would say, oh, no, no, no. Paul would say, to live is Christ. To die is what? Gain. It is gain. It's a different lens. So we can live confidently. We live our lives kind of backwards. We live our lives understanding the end game for us. And that gives us confidence in how we live because we know where we're going. We know what our destiny is. And our purpose in this time that he allows us to continue to live on this planet is to glorify him and to, to be that light for a world that is hurting. Here's your last verse, okay? It's powerful. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. You're looking vertically, not just horizontally. Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven. If you're in a rough place right now. He's not saying pretend that it's not hard. He's just saying this isn't all that there is. There's more. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 15. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And here's what he also says, believers, and always be thankful. You know how you can be thankful in all things? Because you know the outcome. You know the outcome teach and he says let the message uh, of, about Christ in all its richness that's the gospel let it fill your lives teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God there's some joy in your heart you're sing you can sing because I know I'm gonna die but I don't have to live in fear death is not the dominant player anymore Jesus is and here's what it leads to whatever you do or say Wherever you work, whatever you do, whatever you say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Our eternity, if you are in Christ, is sealed and secured. So here's what you get to have as you live. Confidence, contentment, peace. You can be present right now in the moment and enjoy it. Peace-filled, purposeful, thankfulness. I mean, we could keep going. Those are the benefits of a person whose soul, where that hole was there, Christ has come in and filled it. So I want to ask you to pray with me, okay? Our team's going to come out, 
And I want to ask you right now, are you absolutely certain that when the time comes and the number is your number, that you are prepared? And it's not by being a church member. It's not by, by how good you can be. I bet you are a pretty good person. The reality is Jesus not only said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to me but by the Father, or comes to the Father but by me. And it is by his grace. And he offers you eternal life. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Those of you online, the Lord is speaking to you as well right now. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the door, the one who opens that door that was slammed shut in our faces and he opens it up? Through death, his death and his resurrection. Have you put your faith in Jesus right now? You can just call upon him to be your savior. He said, who shall ever so call upon the name of the Lord? will be saved. Some of you, you're already believers. And maybe you've just kind of, you've been worried about some things or you've been just discouraged. And there are some real things that are happening in your life. But my prayer for you today is that you would be encouraged because you can look at your situation and understand it is temporal. And you can understand that the Lord is sovereign. And you can understand that this is not all that there is. So Father, thank you thank you for this truth that we anchor in our lives into today. We thank you that as we pursue all these other things, Lord, that you have revealed to us that it's only through Christ alone that we find our satisfaction. Will you stand with me? And as we sing this final song, make this your response of gratitude back to Jesus today.